and how this has affected me personally. Um, although I was born in this country, my mother was undocumented until I was about 15. Um, the untold suffering at this led to, so been homeless a number of times, always heading up at homelessness units because obviously she's been found that again, that she should, she has no right to rent to the property. Then we're trying to find help, having no money because she wasn't able to get a proper job or if she did get a job, eventually she was found out. Um, at that time, and then living me in Nigeria for 10 years so she could find her feet in this country before I could come back. At that time, I thought, okay, well, that's just kind of what happens. Surely things have changed a little bit. Um, luckily, she's been able to sort her status out years ago and haven't had her status confirmed after 13 years, more than 13 years of living in this country. Um, she's been able to, I don't know, sort of like, she's happy. She now was able to go to college, get education, go to university, actually have a career in something that she loves doing and manage to raise three kids at the same time who despite the experiences they happen to be doing relatively okay in life um, but then that is not the story for a lot of people for a lot of people that suffering never ends and it is an ongoing thing. And what struck me with the lady that I met at the briefing was the impact on her mental health and the way it affected her mentally. And I just raised this for two reasons. Shows that if you are able to navigate the system, if you are given the help that you need, you can actually contribute to the society in which you now call home. Migrants contribute more than they take away. Um, and we need to be able to provide that help for people to, to navigate the system. And also, like I said earlier, the hostile environment is not a new thing. It has been going on. So this has been going on since 1988 and it's still an issue. Um, so I have one thing I've got to mention. We've got, we're going to do three minutes on the first two questions. So okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's three minutes for the two questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, quickly, in terms of what we can do, um, together as a community, like I've said earlier, we've started already um, with the first step of the council adopting a wellness strategy um, and that took a lot of collaboration amongst different groups and that collaboration needs to continue so that we can make sure that we can have something tangible in place and that that strategy um, is implemented and delivered. So that's the answer to my two questions. Thank you. Uh, my direct experience of the hostile environment has been limited. But no one in this country who is from abroad, and especially anyone who is not white, can escape being aware of it. It has made so many of us here legally feel that we are here on sufferance. That we can be, in the present Home Secretary's revised language, non-compliant. Personally, I have often encountered it in recent times over the last decade when I travel to the UK from an airport abroad as young staff especially look askance and anxiously examine the battered three decades old passport in which my <coughs> indefinite leave to remain status is stamped as if they have never seen anything like it. In London, I have for the past 10 years volunteered at an overnight winter homeless shelter where I've encountered many people who have found themselves at the much sharper end of the hostile environment they have to negotiate daily. And now as a counsellor, I see some people who live in fear of officialdom, find it more difficult to rent a home, and are apprehensive of what might happen at their child's school or GP's clinic because of hostile environment policies. Something about me. Before I came to this country in the mid-1970s, I lived in Kenya and Sudan, two former British colonies that through their history have hosted far more refugees than Britain ever has. They did so when I lived there. 
Some of those I went to school with were refugees from neighboring countries or internally displaced people, IDPs. Today, Kenya hosts half a million persons of concern, as the UNHCR puts it, and Sudan 3.3 million. In comparison, at the end of 2017, the UK hosted just 162,000 of the 71.4 million refugees and stateless people in the world. So, what can we do in Harangue to make the nationally hostile environment a locally welcoming one? Through raising awareness, I hope we can also work, we can work to ensure that schools, GPs, and landlords <coughs> don't use hostile environment policies, the policies you have heard uh, something about already, to discriminate unfairly against people. As individuals and as a community, we should help resist and campaign against such policies. Support organizations like Harry Day Welcome to help create a more welcoming environment and show our concern for persons of concern because they should be part of an us and not a done. The council, as you heard, committed to developing a welcome strategy which currently has five aspects. And I think some of these we can go into in questions, which is part of the Connected Communities Program, uh, ESOL provision for speakers of other languages, which is the sixth highest in London, a, a program to prepare for our EU residents for Brexit, uh, a modern slavery strategy, the Labour Group signed the Cooperative Party's Charter on Modern Slavery uh, this month, and a rejection of the hostile environment. And as was you heard earlier, we will be auditing hostile environment policies, will review its relationship with the Home Office and the impact on hostile environment on equality, inclusion, and cohesion in Hungary. And we're we are going to conduct uh, this, this audit over the next few months. Okay, and I think I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm here from Liberty, which is a very old human rights organisation. We were founded in 1934, um, and our mission has stayed the same ever since. We're really here to protect civil liberties and promote human rights. Um, so as everyone's already said, I manage Liberty's work on the hostile environment, among other things. Um, and I mean, how I first learned about the hostile environment seems like a, a big question. Um, it's not something I have personal experience of um, when the Windrush scandal happened, I had a moment of huge relief that my mum had applied for British citizenship and, and not kind of just kept her ILR and her old passport, but she was lucky that she was able to. And she was lucky that she had thought she'd lost that passport one day and thought, hang on a minute, I'd be in a lot of trouble if I had lost this passport. And she applied for British citizenship and there she was. Um, so my experience of the hostile environment isn't personal, it's something that I've known kind of as an activist um, and professionally. Um, so at Room to Heal, which is a really small therapeutic charity, which isn't that far from here actually, I used to um, visit members who were in immigration detention and I supported people to try to access the GP, for example, to navigate the university system. So it's in supporting people that I've really been acquainted with the hostile environment. As for Liberty, um, Liberty has campaigned against the hostile environment since its very inception. So since it was being written into law in the 2014 and 2016 Immigration Acts, Liberty was there briefing, trying to get the provisions taken out of the bills, obviously not entirely successfully. And I think one thing that's really important to recognise is that kind of in the groundswell of sort of anti-hostile environment sentiment post Windrush and after the Stansted 15, um, we should recognise that people have been working on dismantling the hostile environment for really quite a long time. Um, so we had, I don't, many of you must know North East London Migrant Action, NELMA, and they brought their brilliant judicial review and campaign against the policy that said that homeless migrants could be deported because they weren't exercising their treaty rights. That was a great bit of litigation that we saw in 2016. 
Similarly, many of you will have supported the Against Boys for Children boycott of the school census. Um, and that was great because we were an entirely unfunded group of parents, children, teachers um, that managed to mobilise 200,000 people to boycott the school census. Um, we brought litigation represented by Liberty and that, that policy has been scrapped and that's great. Um, similarly, we've just seen the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants take down, well not take down, but the High Court has found that the right to rent scheme is unlawful, it's breaching human rights. Um, the government will probably appeal that, but nevertheless, it's, 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 another, it's another chink in the hostile environment armour. So I think it's really important to look back at those successes and think about what we're building on. Um, but there is a lot of fighting still to do. Um, we've got police handing information on undocumented victims of crime to the Home Office. The Department for Education is still handing children's addresses to the Home Office for Immigration Enforcement. And of course there's still migrant health charging going on that, that many, many people are fighting. Um, in terms of what you can do as individuals, I mean obviously support Home Day Welcome is something I'm really excited about um, because a lot of the hostile environment campaigning has been issue specific but Harringay Welcome is about the whole thing and it's local and I think that's really exciting so obviously support Harringay Welcome but there are other things you can do, you know, you can go and visit people in immigration detention, there are lots of detention visiting groups you can accompany people to their visits with social services. Nelma runs an accompanying scheme. Um, Liberty is running a Care Don't Share campaign, which is basically saying information from essential public services shouldn't be given to the Home Office. So there's a, there's a pledge that you can sign. You can support your local anti-raids group. Uh, Haringey Anti-Raids, I think, meets every Saturday, and that's about supporting people in the community to resist immigration raids. Um, but as has already been said, have those difficult conversations. I think, <coughs> excuse me, what's, what's been said a lot in the context of Windrush is the hostile environment happened to the wrong people. And I think what we really have to do is reiterate that the hostile environment shouldn't happen to anyone. And that can be a difficult conversation to have, but ultimately I think that's the battle that we have to win. So. Well, thank you, Gracie, um, and Julia, and uh, others. I'll be very brief. Um, I think um, I'll probably start by giving you a few words from the people that I've been supporting, um, who have been directly affected by um, the hostile environment. So a six-year-old child would then ask me when the parents were trying to talk to services for support, why don't they like us? I also visited last week um, an asylum seeker who was in hospital because he suffered a stroke last year and he's been in hospital for the past six months. He's um, had to undergo brain surgery as a result of the stroke and at the moment um, you know, both the Crown Authority and the Home Office are fighting not to have to take responsibility to provide him with a nursing home where he will be able to um, uh, continue with his treatment decently. Um, also, um, a woman who had to tell me that she cannot afford to pay her rent anymore and will have to um, do whatever the landlords will ask her to do, including sexual abuse. Um, I also um, had to support um, children who um, approached the teacher one day and said, well, we had to sleep in a garage, in, in a storage unit in Tottenham. Or also um, a professional social worker who told me out of records, we cannot deal with this anymore. We don't know what to do anymore. So this is kind of the things that I'm hearing on the ground every day as a result of the whole sound environment, but I could go on and on and on, including telling you that we now have children locally in Harrogate sleeping in um, Tottenham local police station or in the McDonald's because they have nowhere to sleep. Um, in relation to um, other positive things, um, the wonderful campaign How You're Welcome, which I'm now a, a member, is a wonderful breath of fresh air locally because it's actually um, empowering us in a positive way to think about how we can think positively about the hostile environment in a more sustainable, impactful um, um, way to change things around. And um, I'm also going to add a few things in relation to what else can be done. Um, there's also um, things in relation to hospitals that can be done to visit um, people who are sick. Um, and I think um, Doctors of the World and MEDAC are actually um, uh, sort of leading a wonderful campaign, Docs Not Cops, 
uh, which I think it's worth mentioning here today, but we'll be happy to continue on with this conversation with further questions from yourselves. Thank you. Yeah, as, as you heard at the very beginning of the introduction, one of the campaigns that Harangay Welcome worked on uh, right after the um, uh, Harangay Refugee, when it changed its name from Harangay Refugee Welcome to Harangay Welcome, was on the issue of no recourse to public funds or the NRPF. Uh, and we have a couple of people in the audience who had some questions around that uh, directed at the panel today. I think Hannah is somewhere. Um, maybe we get mic to you. That would be good. Hi, my name is Hannah, and uh, I'm a single parent. I've got two kids. The younger one is a uh, child with special needs. So I've been on um, NRP. I've no recourse for since 2012, and uh, my younger one, when he was born. Um, I was with my ex-partner, it was an abusive situation, so um, he left. So I resorted to my parents' house, and uh, we were just sofa surfing, basically. And uh, I went to the council, explained my situation and everything to them. They said no, they wouldn't help. Um, tried to do an assessment, and they just left us like that. And three years down the line, my son is nearly going to be four, they still haven't done anything about it. Um, they don't want to know. They just passed me on from one person to the other. They, I had to force myself to go back to work. I was in a really bad state. I went through two and a half years of counseling because everything just affected me so badly. And, um, and I'm still in the same position and nothing has changed. And I had to work full time. Sometimes I work so late, finish at 7 p.m have to go and pick up my kids. I've got a child mind up, I have to pay for childcare, I have to pay for so many things, for someone to care for my kids, just so I can go to work, feed them, take care of basic needs. I have nothing else to rent. So my kids are sofa surfing, basically. And it's still, they are still, we are still sofa surfing. The council doesn't want to do anything about it. I tried to go to Citizens Advice Bureau to get some advice. I wanted to, I can't pay for a solicitor or anything. So I want to see someone, speak to the person and explain my situation. Went there eight o'clock in the morning to try and get in early, only for me to get in. And then they, the lady that I explained my situation to her said to me that if I have no recourse, they can't give me anyone to advise me. So they literally threw me out and I left the building crying and I said, I can't believe this. My, myself and my kids feel like we, leave, we are some like aliens living in the borough. I've lived here for years. My parents lived here. And I don't understand why we've been treated like this. I don't understand. It's, it's quite a sad situation. And sometimes when I do explain it, um, everyone marvels and they, and they wonder why are we being treated like I don't understand. I just wanted to ask. What is Harringay Council actually doing to welcome and support no recourse family like myself? And also, what is the council doing to pressure the government to end the no recourse issue? I don't see why my kids should be put in this position to having to, I live with a 70, 70 something year old man who would not sleep until my kids go to bed. They go to bed at 11 p.m. They have to wake up in the morning as early as 6 a.m. to go to school. It affects their education. They get so tired and so many things. And sometimes we, we feel threatened that they're going to throw us out. And some, I, I get so worried about it that if it happens, what do I do? There was an, another question from Judith, who is a nonce of tonight, but has asked me to read this on her behalf, um, which is, uh, why is the support for no recourse for public fund migrants in Harringay so low? Um, I'm currently on £200 a month, income that is um, 
50 pound a week to survive on. Other boroughs like Hackney get over 400 a month for single mothers. In Barnet, it's 100 pound a week for mothers with, uh, with a single child. Um, so that's one issue, one very direct, specific question. And more generally, the Home Office seems to only be interested in figures, not just individual cases. Is there a fair system for looking at cases and why? Um, so why, do, and why are they freeing people up so they can have a positive impact and benefit the society here as well? Um, and are there any, are there any, oh, you want to, you want to speak? Oh, okay. Other borrowers have taken consideration that they're supporting, with no recourse to public funds, they're supporting the, the parent and the child, while in Harrogate they only support just the child. And on a £200 budget, I have tried like everything and it really doesn't stretch. And how is Harrogate taking into consideration that if they, if, because, with, 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 so it ties into the question with the Home Office. I feel that the Home Office looks at numbers, trying to get people out or just trying to reduce things just to make it look good on paper. And they're not looking at individual cases where if these people are able to have the opportunity to work, which is not on the ground, if they actually work, they can support the NHS, they can actually pay taxes and whatnot. So why is it they're not looking on the flip side where they help people in our, in our situation that we, we can be able to not be on benefit, but actually work. We have, we have an impact to give to um, the country that we are actually in at the moment. We have skills and needs. We have skills and talented people, and we're not seeing that because we're not being given the opportunity. And how is Harringay not being welcoming to um, immigrants or other borrowers actually taking consideration because I live in a safe house um, for abused women. Because that's what happens when you're an immigrant. When nobody looks at your story, you're, 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 you're liable to be abused. And this is what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And just like that lady said, we are, we are actually on counseling because it's, it's, it's not been a very um, welcoming environment. Other bars have taken consideration to help people. And hopefully, I hope that Harrogate will take into consideration to help people as well, even if we're going to be the first borough that actually does something and um, set a trend, or if you want to <laughs> how, how are we fixed for time? Okay, should we take, um, maybe we just take one or two more questions and then just go through the panel one more time, maybe that's a better way of doing it rather than topping the time too much. Hand at the back. Uh, Hi, my name is Alessandra and I work for a charity in South London that gives advice and, and campaigns for migrants, uh, asylum seekers and refugees. And in the last six months or so, a lot of our service users have reported uh, having issues with opening bank accounts. So I was wondering, and this is people who have the right to open a bank account, so obviously they cannot be paid by their employers, which force them, forces them often to um, resort to cash and hand work, which obviously is not very safe. Uh, for them because employers often end up not paying them um, or abusing them. Um, and another, another problem that our service users also are experiencing is not being able to volunteer, not even to work, is to volunteer with uh, charities and also organisations. So I think you made a really good point about the hostile environment and how that really pervades all areas of life and how that really creates a culture of fear among landlords, among employers, that the other, the, the, the different person, doesn't have the right to be here. So I was wondering if maybe someone in the panel is doing some work on that, maybe Liberty is, or if you have any thoughts on these two issues. Thank you. Thank you. There's one, there's one more question. We had a box uh, that people were
submitting questions into. So I've got some of the box questions. So I'm going to add this one in, which is maybe one for you, Gracie. Uh, we have successfully challenged the right to rent um, checks in court. Is there any chance of challenging the right to work checks on the same grounds that it's discriminatory? Um, maybe you tweet. Yeah, yeah, let's go and get going with the answers. Then. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the question about NRPF, which is clearly one of the biggest issues that face uh, migrants and uh, uh, asylum seekers. And that is and that is actually going to be it is one of the main focuses of the audit that I spoke about earlier. That is Say, uh, that the council is currently undertaking, reviewing the support that Haringey currently gives to uh, individuals with no recourse to public funds, which, as you have highlighted, uh, is, has some serious deficiencies in the disciplines. And, we, and one, I guess part of the audit is about looking at what other bodies do and how they are doing it, and and if they are doing it better, how we can do it here. Uh, but as far as the uh, you know, people with particular uh, issues are uh, with an RPF or anything else, is do go to your counselor. And because an individual counselor, there's a limit to what we can do, but we can at least put the questions to the officers and, uh, and keep following it up until we get some answers. And see what, you may not have a course to public funds, but what other kinds of ways are there of getting the system to work for people who need it? Uh, so I think I would strongly encourage you to go to your counselor in whichever ward that you are in, and if you want, at, uh, at the end of the meeting, there are several of my colleagues, uh, counselors here, uh, and uh, and just I'll give me your details and I'll pass it on. But, uh, but from one of the, some of the questions, that there does seem like there are some issues existing already within Harangue, which. Yes. Is, been raised yeah. many times. Yeah. So I think I mean, that's, that's, that's part yeah. of what the audit is about, is unearthing the dimensions of it, yeah. what are the specific problems, and how we can best address them, and do that speedily, not in, in, in months, uh, in the next few months, rather than uh, waiting for long. The other point I wanted to say uh, about opening bank accounts, which was mentioned, I mean, this is the kind of thing, is you become a normal person. Because the, I've also come across people uh, who can't get a driving license for the same reason, because they cannot uh, uh, establish their legal status. So you do become so constrained in whether you can move, whether you can spend money, whether you can find a job, whether you can find a place to stay. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to... This is quite interesting because obviously from what I understand from um, the law recourse, the public funds, um, where you have a child in need, the local authority has a legal obligation um, to protect that child. And it would appear that at the very basic level, they are not meeting that legal obligation. So yes, it's all well and good that we want to do this audit and we should do this audit, but there is a breach of the legal obligation and we need to be questioning that. Um, yes, like as James says, we can ask questions around this because it seems to me that this shouldn't be happening in the first place. And if it is, then we need to be questioning why on the basis of legality. So that's the only thing I've got to add. On the bank account, I don't have enough knowledge, I can't actually answer that, so I might leave it to the expert on the panel to potentially provide a little bit more. But my job on the council is to ask this question, as James said, and keep pushing it. But immediately, that should not be happening at all. And we need to find out why it is happening. And it just goes back to the point that we've all raised 
in that yes, we want to fight against the, hostile, the national policy of the hostile environment, but of what are we doing locally within the constraint of the law to actually make people's lives that be easier. We seem to be failing at just that already. Um, so, in time, so one thing that I should have said is that you might have already seen it, Liberty and lots of other groups last May published a little booklet called The Guide to the Hostile Environment. Um, and I would have bought some, but we've only got 15 copies left, but we are updating it for this May. Um, and that basically looks at every single measure in turn, so it explains the bank account checks, the driving licence checks, and points you to groups that are working on it and just supports people to understand the policy so that you can do whatever you think needs doing to mobilise against it. Um, in terms of the bank account checks, I think that there are two things going on. So there's the, there's the issue that you, you can't hold a bank account if you don't have the right to be in the UK. But there's also the issue of banks basically de-risking because they wanted to reduce their exposure to um, kind of assets that, assets that they shouldn't have. So kind of a lot of it is to do with perceptions of terrorism and stuff like that. Because when I worked at Room to Heal, I remember we had quite a lot of, and you will have seen this in the news anyway, a lot of Somali clients just having their bank accounts closed with no notice at all, um, because it cost the bank so much money to do due diligence on them um, in comparison with the amount of money people tended to have in their bank accounts. So I think there are two things going on there. What we used to do, I'm not sure that the Red Cross does this anymore, but when someone got their status, the Red Cross would go with them to the bank and support them to open a bank account, and it may be if you have the resources, that if somebody can accompany someone to the bank, you may have already tried this and it's very intensive. Still no good. Okay. Um, there is also a campaign group called No Borders in Banks who are working on this. Um, and the other thing that I'd say is that often to challenge these things in court, you need, um, it needs an individual who's been affected by the measure to take the claim and often that's not someone's number one priority when they're undocumented or have precarious immigration status. But if there are people who have been affected, who are now in a more secure position, who want to explore things like litigation, or even just telling their stories so that we can use them in campaigning, then ask them to get, think about getting in touch with me, um, because these are the kinds of stories on the ground that Liberty doesn't get to hear because we're a kind of second tier organisation. Um, and then just on the right to work court challenge, I mean, I'd love to do this, it'd be great. Um, one thing that's important to say about the right to rent challenge, part of the reason that, that was so successful is that the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants conducted really meticulous primary research over a number of years. So in partnership with the Residential Landlords Association so that they could evidence the changes in behavior that the scheme itself was causing. Um, so somebody would have to design some research and implement it and it would be more difficult to do because those checks have been in place in 1997 rather than being new. So it would be more difficult for employers to say, well, I would have acted like this before the checks came in and now I'd act like this. But it's eminently possible. Um, I'm not sure it's something that we could take up right now, but I'm sure someone would be interested in it. Um, and then just on... Um, you may already have tried to do this, but to the, to the people who spoke about um, having no recourse to public funds, I guess one organisation that might be in the room and might not be in the room is Harringay Migrant Support Centre. Um, and I know that they have done a lot of work and are really adept in supporting people to get their NRPF conditions lifted and to access legal advice. So it may be that you're better off going to them than to somewhere like the Citizens Advice Bureau, which, which does more generic advice. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, just to add on the bank checks, Grace, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, part of the checks a bit suspended last year, okay? Is it the, the te it's very technical issue on the, the sharing of information between banks and the home office? So not the whole checks have been completely suspended, but as part of the information between banks and the home office that are no longer being shared out of May last year. Some. Yes, some, some of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a very limited category, but yeah, it's not really helpful, so it would be really nice to get rid of it um, all that entirely. But um, um, yes, in relation to the bank checks um, um, or bank accounts, difficulties in opening a bank account, 
Um, Red Cross, I'm not sure that they still um, um, deploy volunteers to accompany um, migrants. I mean, recently we had issues, um, similar issues at Freedom from Torture, and uh, it's, a, it's a really ongoing um, problem. Things that we tend to do is to hand them um, a letter so that before the person actually presents, um, we kind of we kind of been successful with those. I'm not sure because it's the medical foundation or because of you know how the the template has been worded, but we we have been successful with those. And then also um, the NASAF sort of group, which is a group of local organisations um, uh, with the Home Office working on issues related to um, hostile environment, and we've raised issues related to the bank accounts checks. And there's also been um, the inclusion in the group of uh, bank managers, local bank managers, so they are now aware of it. And we talk about Barclays and Net uh, Networks. I'm not trying to publicise anyone. I'm not sponsored by anyone. But just to um, name uh, a couple of high street banks that are um, clearly aware of the issue regarding uh, bank uh, accounts. Um, and also regarding um, an RPF, um, yes, you're right. There is, um, um, let's just say, a legal obligation or a duty to carry out a duty in the presence of a child in need. And actually, a child with a special uh, need is by law considered a child in need. So there is, um, I'm just speaking of, Think of Hannah, yeah. who, uh, yeah, who you, you mentioned that you had a child who um, had uh, special needs. Um, so legally, your child is considered um, a child in need. So yes, locally there are organisations such as um, Hanga Margaret Support Centre, Project 17 as well, who's doing a wonderful job in relation to challenges, challenging the support rates actually. Um, um, in Harangay and um, also um, Harris Harangay um, who is actually at the moment got 100% rates of success rates in relation to challenging um, lifting conditions um, on lower cost of public funds um, um, leave to remain. On the support rates more specifically because you talked about the, the audit um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice um, step forward to want for Harangay to be looking at you know councillors to be looking at what's going on um, in, in the local authority in relation to the culture and the practices. Um, but I just want to remind here that um, the law does not, uh, there is no blanket rate in relation to um, the support rate that should be given to a child and the child in his family um, and that we should be looking at the needs of the child. So technically it could be any rates depending on the circumstances of the family because that's what the, the law says. And talking about the law, I'm just talking about um, the Children Act. And that's what the law said, we should just go by the law. Um, and then lastly, I think, in relation to um, discriminatory and the challenge with right to work, yes, I think that's the whole basis, actually, upon which we would like to challenge the hostile environment. There is a massive element of discriminatory uh, discrimination and racism, I have to say, structural racism um, in the light of the hostile environment. Um, more specifically, a, um, a very um, high gender element and the ethnicity element I find, especially in relation to no equals to public funds, that it's more, um, if you find a large proportion of single mothers of BME um, uh, groups, so we're talking about black and black minorities. Um, yeah. again to all our speakers and um, I'm being signaled that we have to end but yeah thank you so much for your really wonderful contributions and uh, if any questions they may hang around or they may run off so get here quick. I'm going to hand back over to Leia now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And really quickly, I think it's a testament to all of our passion and commitment that we're here now uh, late on a weeknight and listening and engaging with this much intensity. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, thank you, Akram, for chairing. Thank you to the people also who asked questions and shared their experiences. And really to all of us, because even though we didn't all speak, the listening is a, a political force for change as well. And uh, I also wanted to say a final thank you, which is to all my Herringay Welcome colleagues who behind the scenes made everything happen. I sort of swanned in tonight and stood up in front of you, and they did all of this fantastic work over months uh, to make this happen. And it's through that kind of personal and family time and commitment and effort that we can build these spaces to challenge the hostile environment. So thank you again to everybody.